Hello and welcome. I am Professor Mackenzie Lemhouse, Instruction and Outreach Librarian at USC Lancaster. I've prepared the following presentation as an introduction to archival research for those who may have never used archival resources before. Before I jump into the content, let me explain why I, an academic librarian, am here talking to you about archives. Before coming to USC Lancaster, I worked in archives and special collections. I have worked behind the scenes and directly with rape searchers, and I love helping people find the resources that they need. Since 2015, I have worked as a processing archivist, a digitization tech, and user services staff, so you can say that I literally know archives inside and out. I have also used archival collections extensively in my own student research, such as when I compiled an archival history of the AIDS crisis through American public health documents. I have a couple of pictures of myself doing what I love with the old, old stuff, just for your viewing pleasure. So, what are archives? The definition can vary, and it's a little bit wiggly depending on your context, but for the purpose of this presentation, archives are sets of records and primary sources. It can be an official, established archive where researchers can come and visit, or it can be a personal, you know, family stash of photographs, birth certificates, and the like. One really good thing about living in the 21st century is that many archives have digitized their collections and shared them online, which makes these wonderful collections more accessible for researchers all over the world. So that's what an archives is, but what does an archive have? What can I find in these places? You might find paper and bound manuscripts, such as ledgers, uh, journals, things like that. You might find visual materials like photographs and artwork. You might also find uh, digital content. Archivists now manage uh, hard drives and other born digital content, as well as microformed or digitized contents. So this is information that has been taken into a new medium for uh, preservation purposes. Because an archive can be many things, there can be many things in archives. So you need to keep an open mind as you explore these resources to find things that will suit your research. So to jump into the meat of it, what is a primary source and why does it matter? The Society of American Archivists defines a primary source as material that contains firsthand accounts of events and that was created contemporaneous to those events or later recalled by an eyewitness. This means that this is the closest thing that researchers can get to experiencing the thing that they are researching themselves. This might come in the form of a diary, a letter, a photograph, you know, the possibilities are endless, but the unifying, unifying factor is that the, this item represents the perspective of the individuals who experience these events. You will also probably find what we call secondary and tertiary sources in archives as well. Um, newspapers are considered in some contexts to be primary and in others to be secondary. Um, and these extra strata of um, source material can provide more context and help you um, develop a better understanding for the archival sources that you encounter. So that's primary sources. I mentioned secondary and tertiary sources. Without getting bogged down in the weeds here, a secondary source in the context of what I'm talking about today is the next step out, like you're zooming out from primary sources. Secondary sources analyze or expand upon primary sources. So for example, a newspaper article um, about or that references a diary or journal entry, um, something that kind of provides an additional level of interpretation from that first perspective represented in the primary source. A tertiary source is, again, another step out. You zoom out a little bit further. These sources either simplify or summarize primary and secondary sources, or they organize and help you use them. So for example, a dictionary or an index or something like a phone book would be considered a tertiary source in many, uh, many contexts. However, these definitions can vary depending on your context, so just kind of take that as a general introduction to the concept. So many people associate archives with the study of history, and they think that historians are the main users. And while, yes, they do use archives quite a lot in their research, 
um, archival resources can strengthen almost any type of research project. They can help us develop a more deep um, understanding of the events and the people that lived through them. Primary sources and archival resources are useful in just about every discipline, um, again, because they help us to engage with these historic events and um, previous ways of thinking, especially useful when we're trying to look for patterns or understand why we do or do not do things a certain way. So if it's not just for historians, who can use archives? I've listed a few examples on the screen. Um, I am a humanities girl. I studied literature and language before I went to library school, so all of my <laughs> examples do skew a little bit humanities, but some examples might be using diaries and letters or photographs to look at social trends. You might look at social um, announcements in newspapers. Um, if you are looking into historic medicine or trends throughout um, the history of medical practice, you might examine, again, newspapers, they're great for everything, but also, you know, doctor's ledgers, but less, um, less official, more personal documents like diaries and letters from a time, you know, if you know that there was an epidemic at a certain time that you're studying, you might look at these personal documents to see what everyday people and not just doctors and health officials were saying. There are so many examples and far too many for me to list in this short presentation, um, but you can see quite a few on screen. And chances are, if you are studying a topic, it has a past and there are primary sources that would be relevant to your research. So you may be saying, okay, that's great, um, but I still don't know what this process looks like. What does it look like? Um, archival research in general is going to be a much slower process than, you know, I know that I need four peer-reviewed articles to list on my annotated bibliography and I go to the database through the library website. Um, unless you are using digitized archives, which there are some really wonderful um, repositories out there. Um, I have often heard archival research compared to a fishing expedition um, versus, you know, the quick asked and answered model that Google has spoiled us with. Archives are also what we refer to as closed stacks, so that means that users cannot walk in and browse the shelves themselves. You must do a little bit of research before even visiting in order to request materials through the staff. Um, you will sit, most commonly sit down at a desk in a common area or a reading room, and they will bring the materials to you. You will also probably be given a copy in another format if the original document is too fragile. This is most often going to be microfilm. If you haven't used microfilm, that's fine. Most people haven't nowadays. Um, the staff will help you. Um, but you may also receive digital scans or paper photocopies. And this is, you know, not a way of gatekeeping the information, but rather to ensure that these irreplaceable unique documents um, aren't, you know, accidentally ripped or don't, you know, just fall apart because they're used so often. It is a preservation practice. And in general, archive staff are very friendly and passionate. They will almost always be happy to answer questions and help you if you find something that's unfamiliar. Um, one thing that you'll see come up several times in this presentation is my encouraging you to ask if you can take pictures or request scans because while it's really fun to dive in and look at these documents, you might not fully realize how important something is until you get home and you start, you know, compiling your research. If the archive permits, see if you can take pictures with your cell phone um, and make sure you write down what's in this picture so that it actually makes sense. Um, or you can request scans for later use so you don't have to be in the space at all times. If you do uh, dive into archival research, you will likely encounter some foreign terminology. So I've prepared some quick a cheat sheet of vocab for you. You will see reference to finding aids, and I'll mention them in a minute. A finding aid is basically a document that uh, accompanies a processed collection. It will give you information about, you know, where it came from, the context that you need to consider when you're looking at the records, as well as um, often including um, organizational information. So it might break, you know, a large collection of 50 plus boxes into thematic series. So series one might be photographs, series two might be business records, and this will help you to narrow your search 
to only the relevant sections of the collection. Um, and it's really, really useful when you are kind of skimming through something large and un unwieldy. You will also probably see reference to accessions or accession numbers. Um, an accession is a single set of records from a donation. Um, an accession number is a tracking number assigned by the archivist to track this accession. Um, it's really an internal reference uh, number, but most major citation style guides will require that you include the accession number in your citation if it is known. Um, you can usually find this number either noted in the finding aid for the collection um, or written on labels for the boxes, folders, and sometimes penciled into the documents themselves, usually in the up, hand, up left hand corner. Excuse me. And one final note on terminology, you will often see archives and library, especially special collections libraries, interchanged. Um, and I don't really have rhyme or reason for this. I would just tell you to keep an open mind when you're searching. Um, some archives are kind of nestled within larger institutions, and so they might show up with a different name. So as an example, both the South Carolina Historical Society in Charleston and the South Carolina Library in Columbia, South Carolina, have really wonderful um, archival collections with high research value, but neither is technically called an archives. It just helps to, you know, be aware that you might be looking for something that is a library, an archive, a museum, a historical society, a genealogical society, you know, kind of branch out and click and read what they have to say about their own collections. Let them do the speaking, if that makes sense at all. <laughs> So if you are ready to explore and see what type of archival uh, holdings might be out there to support your research, um, it can be really intimidating to jump out and try and find these collections. Um, it's not quite as obvious of, as a process as just Googling it. So I've broken down you know, three kind of points of entry to archival sources that might be useful for you as you do your own research. The easiest case will be um, a situation where you see a reference to an archival source in a secondary source. Um, you see it, you know, referenced in a book or an article and you think, oh, that sounds really useful. I want to see that myself. The citation will probably include the collection and the name of the institution that holds it. Simply Google this information and make contact with the archivist or check and see if it's already been digitized and might already be online for you to browse without any need for human contact. One step up in difficulty from having a nice, pretty citation to reference um, would be a situation where you know that something is bound to exist, but you aren't sure where it is. You know, an example would be, you know, I'm sure that George Washington's papers have ended up somewhere, right? Um, surely. <laughs> not every archive is going to have their collections digitized online, and not every archive is going to have every single item, you know, noted in a catalog online. You'll want to try searching websites like Archive Grid or OCLC WorldCat, which I will reference later in my presentation, or you can ask your friendly reference librarian for guidance in searching. And the last most difficult version of this uh, entry point is I'm not sure if something exists or not. Um, you could try googling, you know, your topic archives, so George Washington archives or, you know, South Carolina Revolutionary War archives, um, keywords like that that might show up um, on websites that have relevant information and then you can then read through and determine, you know, with the context that's on this website or in this, you know, uh, a reference on a Google book, um, you can determine this is where I want to go or I need to pull back and adjust my searching strategies. Um, this is a very active process that requires some trial and error. So explore the results, try different keywords, don't get discouraged if you can't find anything, and as always please feel free to ask your friendly librarians for help if you get stuck. Um, I am always happy to help and I know that many many of my colleagues are as well. So now that you have discovered your archival collections and you know what you need to access, here is a brief overview of the process of visiting and using archives. 
From anywhere, if the collection is digitized, you can probably browse it online. If materials are uploaded online, it is usually okay to use with attribution, such as with the Library of Congress's digitized collections online, but be sure to check for a use statement or contact the archives for permission if you want to use the images in a publication or a presentation. Um, one really useful thing with digitized collections that is helpful for um, browsing and exploring and finding similar subjects is using the subject tags and other controlled vocabulary that you will usually see in the description underneath the digitized image. You can use these links to explore. They function very similar to hashtags. Um, I highly recommend clicking around and exploring those. Now let's say that you see a reference to a record, but you do not see scans of it available online. This is an indication that you will probably need to schedule a visit with the archive or request scans. So if you want to visit the archive, you should contact the staff using the contact information um, listed on their website. You can also you know, Google it and find their phone number and their friendly staff will be happy to help you. You will most likely need to request materials ahead of time, and you will most likely need to request specific materials ahead of time. Not the entire 60 box collection, but a specific subset, you know, boxes 2 through 3, etc. You will also want to request, if it's not already online, finding aids or box lists. Um, you will want to, again, try to narrow your request to a specific date range or topic um, to save your time and ensure that the archive staff are able to pull uh, the most relevant things, make the most of everybody's time. If you are traveling and making any kind of hotel reservations um, or requesting time away from work, etc., you will want to allow enough time to use materials. Depending on the scope of your project, it might take a lot longer to work through um, these archival sources than you'd expect. Um, one, because you have to read through it and it just takes time, especially with old uh, handwriting on possibly faded documents. Um, also, just because you know, you're moving slowly with these fragile documents, it's usually going to take more time than you expect. If you cannot travel, uh, I would recommend asking the archive to see if they offer research scanning services. A lot of times this is done for a fee, um, and it depends on the condition of the materials and the staff availability at the archive, but it is a service that many offer. They might say no, but it never hurts to ask. This is often done for a fee, as I said, um, but sometimes fees might be waived for educational or nonprofit use, so again, it never hurts to ask. So some etiquette for researchers as you do visit archives. As I mentioned on previous slides, you will need to request materials. The archivists are most likely overstaffed or understaffed, and they cannot read an entire collection for you just in case what you're looking for is there. Researchers are expected to be active participants in the research process. If you do visit the archive in person, you will uh, probably need to register with a photo ID, so plan ahead. Um, and just a note, some people are taken off guard. Bags and food and drinks, including water, are usually not permitted in the reading room of, a, of an archive. Um, most will have lockers available for you, but do plan accordingly and don't bring, you know, your whole book bag in there um, and need, you know, a million things out of it. Also, just on a personal human level, most archives are pretty cold because of preservation needs for the paper, so you might want to bring a light jacket. Some handling guidelines once you actually have the stuff in front of you. You will want to remember that many archival records are completely unique and irreplaceable. They are literally one of a kind. So some tips to help keep them safe and make them available for future researchers. You will want to move slowly, turn the pages slowly, give them lots of support, and leave them in the same condition you found them. If somehow, you know, a small tear does happen, things happen, these papers are brittle, do be sure to alert archive staff so that they can look at it and, you know, make any kind of preservation calls.
You will want to keep your hands clean and dry. Wash and dry your hands before visiting. Um, skip the fancy scented lotion. Um, paper likes, generally speaking, likes human hands. We do not like chemicals. You will also want to avoid wearing long dangly jewelry and clothing like scarves, anything that you might accidentally catch on these fragile breaking off uh, ledgers and things like that. You just want to avoid it if possible. You may be given gloves. Lots of uh, movies like to depict archivists with these white cotton gloves. Um, this is a source of debate amongst archivists, so you may or may not be given them. If they do ask you to wear them, be cautious as you handle paper and turn the pages carefully because the cotton will sometimes snag on brittle chunks of paper. If they do not give you gloves, that's also fine. Um, just avoid touching um, photo surfaces directly as the oils on your fingers can damage the emulsion. You will want to most likely take notes. If you do so, please only use pencil. Pens are typically not allowed because they do tend to smudge. And do not write on the records. Yes, people try to write on the records. Don't do that. Also, you will want to, as a courtesy, limit cell phone use while you are in the reading room. Um, you know, step out to take a call just to be kind to your fellow researchers and the staff in the reading room. All right, so you have visited the archive. You have looked at the stuff. Now, how do I use this stuff in my research? Typically, if you're just quoting from a source or citing the information in your paper, you do not need to ask for permission. Uh, you will want to, of course, cite the information um, properly. If you want to display, publish, or otherwise share images of archival materials, you will most likely need to ask for permission. Even if it is in the public domain, most archives have some kind of rights to image control. And there's complicated, you know, public domain, fair use, and donor agreements. It's all a weird slider. So when in doubt, just ask the archivist. So, speaking of citations, when you do make your citations, you are going to notice that archival documents are a little bit different from published documents. In addition to the obvious, you know, author, creator, uh, title, you will also most likely need to include, if known, an accession number and box and folder information. Um, and so you are going to want to be really cautious, or not cautious, but aware as you work through these documents. Um, record not only the information that you need, but also, you know, what box did it come from? What folder did it come from? Because archives are so unique and each collection is organized differently, it's really important to get your citation right so that future researchers can go back and find the same documents. Um, to this end, preferred citations are usually listed in a finding aid or a catalog record, so check there. There's no need to reinvent the wheel. If it's not listed, I would recommend just asking the archivist or the archive staff for help for, with your citations because every item is unique um, and they are going to know the best way to cite and credit the information in their collection for future discoverability. So some additional notes about publishing images. Um, again, you're going to want to ask for permission if you are publishing an image uh, from an archival collection. Um, you will also find it useful to ask about photography and image use policies while you are at the archive because some, not all, archives do allow researchers to take photos for their own future reference. Um, so for example, you know, I'm trying to make the most of a two-day trip to an archive out of state. It might be useful to snap pictures of the items or scan them, you know, as, as the archive permits. Scan them so that I can take time in the future to really read through them. Um, I would recommend if you do this to include the labeled folder next to the item in your photograph so that all of your citation information is just right there in the picture. This makes things much, much easier for you down the road when you are writing your bibliography, but it also makes it easier for archive staff if they are called upon to pull these same documents in the future. Um, again, you're going to want to ask for permission and also bear in mind that some archives will charge fees if you want to um, publish or display their images. Um, 
this is up to their discretion, but they may waive it for nonprofit or educational use. So be sure to share how and why you want to use these images when you make your request so that they have all of the relevant information to determine their fees. All right, we are nearing the end. I have compiled a couple of useful links if you are interested in diving into archival research. Uh, the first item on this page is a very handy guide to citing archival sources put together by the staff at Purdue University. Um, if you Google Purdue University citing archival sources, this will come up. I still use this as a cheat sheet from time to time because, as I mentioned, citing archival sources is a case-by-case -case basis and it's uh, every item is unique. This is very helpful. The second and third items you see on this list are ArchiveGrid and OCLC WorldCat. These two websites are very, very useful for finding collections online. ArchiveGrid kind of makes, it's like the Google of finding aids, if that makes sense at all. Um, you can use this to search across different institutions for uh, finding aids if they exist online. It's very helpful. Um, likewise, OCLC WorldCat, while intended more for libraries, does also search across different institutions. And archival materials do appear in OCLC WorldCat. So I would recommend searching both of these if you are trying to find, you know, just sources on a general topic. The next few sources are all digitized collections and resources that are free online. Uh, these are great if you are, you know, I'm writing a paper or I'm putting together a presentation and I'm looking for an image to go along with it, but also they include um, manuscript items, so written out documents, there might be published items, um, there's just really honestly no end to the wealth of information that is included in these digitized collections, so I definitely encourage you to explore each of these. I will briefly flash up all of my references. These are definitions and images used in this presentation. And I will conclude by saying uh, there is a lot of information <laughs> included in this presentation. I tried to condense it as much as possible. Obviously, I'm very passionate about archives, and I think that primary sources can enrich any research that you may do. I am always happy to answer questions or to help kind of guide you in the right direction with your research, whether it's archival or uh, otherwise. So you can contact me with the information on screen. My email is limhouse at mailbox.sc.edu or you can drop into Medford Library during my office hours, which are 9 to 4, Monday through Thursday, and 9 to noon on Fridays. You can just come up to the front desk and ask for Mackenzie. Um, you can also scan the QR code included on the screen to schedule a private research consultation with me, um, not only for this type of research, but, you know, if you have to find a bunch of sources for your class project or, you know, you need citation help, I'm happy to help you get where you need to go. So. Thank you to the Research Club for asking me to present. I hope that this information is helpful, and I hope that some of you will take me up on my offer to explore the wonderful world of archival sources. Thank you so much, and I hope you have a great day.